welcome to the next edition of the Briefings Direct podcast series. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at Intra Arbor Solutions, your host and moderator. Amid rapidly growing IT security costs and the added complexity of distributed workforces, the challenges facing IT services providers are clearly outrunning past practices. That's why more automation, integration, and acquiring security services as a service are in hot demand. Stay with us now as the next Briefings Direct Security Innovations discussion examines how Heartland Business Systems is seeking new ways and new partners to assure that security incidents are kept in check across a variety of hybrid IT services and scenarios. Here to share his story of increasingly embracing security as a service is our guest. Please join me in welcoming Jason Nuss, Vice President of Cloud Services at Heartland Business Systems in Little Shoot, Wisconsin. Welcome, Jason. Tina, thanks for having me. We're delighted you're with us. Jason, what are some of the top trends that are driving your need to do things differently when it comes to risk management and endpoint security? Well, I think security is getting more important and broader every day. Um, cyber insurance has definitely had a huge influence over the last several years. You know, I can remember when cyber insurance applications were just a couple of questions. Now they're, in some cases, a dozen pages long, and, and that's really urging requirements to really tighten up security practices. At the same time, the hackers are getting smarter, and they're moving on to new techniques. We're starting to see more extortion as opposed to just encryption, which really has a much greater effect on not only that specific customer, but sometimes those customers' clients as well. Over the last few years with the pandemic, we've, we've also seen migration to mobile workforce. You know, some of the companies we worked with have closed office doors and aren't going back to physical offices, which has brought in other challenges as well to make sure that their environments are kept secure. And how about the current hybrid IT environment? How is that forcing you to do things differently? Yeah, I think now data is really everywhere, as is your staff. So it used to be able to be able to secure just inside of your walls and you didn't have to worry so much about external trends. But now you have people working from home and accessing home networks, which now makes those endpoints even more vulnerable to other security threats that don't sit necessarily behind your corporate firewall. Um, you also have data and cloud services applications that you need to make sure those are secure as well, which you know I think it plays a huge factor in that. Some of the common misconceptions we see is, is that the cloud is perfect. A lot of people think that it just includes everything. It's you know fully secure, fully redundant, but that's just really not the case. And people need to take a little bit more time to really look at the technologies that they're looking at, at adopting, making sure those companies are on the up and up and that they have proper security trends and backups and disaster recovery strategies so that those SaaS applications, should they have an outage, aren't service impacting to their business as well. Yeah, that's right. We don't know to just look at our own security situation. We have to look into the security robustness, if you will, of our entire supply chains. Absolutely. All right. How about costs, labor costs and other costs? How is that affecting your ability to deliver a security effectively? Yeah, I think security costs over the last several years have gone up quite a bit. I don't have any stats on this, but I often tell customers five, six hundred percent from what it was, you know, maybe five years ago. You know, it used to be, I remember back in the day, I've been around this industry almost 30 years now. You only really had to worry about an antivirus product and a modem for connectivity to your to the internet. Then it moved into firewalls. But now you have things like EDR, MDR, XDR. It's very confusing in the landscape there. You have SIM, SOC, privileged access management, SASE, all these other new these new technologies that it's making the landscape very, very cloudy. No pun intended, but sometimes we have to write the ship for the customer to make sure that we're looking at security from a proper rollout perspective, you know, starting with the most critical things, whether it be backup or MFA or endpoint security, and then maybe layering on some of those additional services. It doesn't make any sense for a customer to start out with penetration testing if they haven't secured their environment ahead of time, because all we're going to then is find, it, find our holes there, right? Why is security as a service and more automation generally attractive to folks like you as you're specifying your next generation? Expertise at scale is very important and often overlooked. Just saying you have a SOC and maybe it's a guy or two is not necessarily good enough. You need to be able to, to react appropriately. And you need to be able to to look at and, and have seen those techniques before. So having a larger staff, having some knowledge base behind that is very important in solving the issues or, or even identifying the issues ahead of time. 
automation is critical to that. So when you're ingesting, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of logs, you need to be able to comb through that uh, data really quickly. So automating that is critical. You know, you're starting to see more AI and machine learning take over that space so that um, a lot of these more recent products that have come out are using those technologies to identify threats before maybe an analyst would have caught them manually. And as we mentioned before, we have to be concerned about our suppliers and our partners, perhaps more than ever, they're off for under attack as well. So um, how has that changed over the past several years in how you look at your suppliers and what you look for from them? As far as our suppliers go, you know, we've started to take a deeper look at the supply chain completely, right? So there's a lot of smaller companies out there that are coming out with new technologies. And so as we look to vet things out, not only are we vetting out functionality, but we're also vetting out security elements. And just recently, we were looking at a product that would integrate into our CRM tool to do some better data mining out of out of Exchange and Outlook and Microsoft 365 and come to find out, hey, that data is being stored overseas. They're also injecting a bunch of full email messages. And so we had concerns around how those tools are addressing that. You know, just turning on an API isn't always a good thing. You want to make sure that you're minimizing the impact that should they have a breach that it's not impacting you as well. So you have to look to vendors and make sure that they're following best practices. And if they're not, I think it's good to call them out and let them know, like, look, you don't need access to all of these tables for the pieces that you're trying to access. Let's really kind of minimize the blast radius should you be compromised to not affect us as well. So it's not only buyer beware, it's also services subscriber beware, right? Absolutely. Some of the other things that are playing in it to it as well, you know, with the mobile workforce, you have to secure that edge and making sure you have good endpoint control there and firewalls and other components. You know, that was one of the things where the Defender, you know, rose above for us was being able to store those things. Looking at other cloud storage providers, you know, you see shadow IT out there. You know, I cringe when I hear people that don't have corporate policy around cloud storage and where they're putting data using things like Dropbox or OneDrive. It's okay to use those things, but make sure that you have a governance policy around it. You have a backup strategy around it. And you know that how you're going to be securing that data as well. Yeah, we've seen a lot of sprawl and sort of ungoverned use. And I guess that's good for a while, but eventually you have to get mature about how you do that. Let's hear about Heartland Business System. Tell us about your company, what you do, and what you think distinguishes you from other managed service providers. Sure. So Heartland Business Systems is based out of the upper Midwest. And we're just south of Green Bay, Wisconsin. I think we're up to about 12 locations throughout Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, Arkansas, and Arizona now. Um, we've been around since the 90s. I think around 650 total employees with about 350 technical service professionals across many specializations. I think if people often ask, well, what sets you apart from you know the other guys in the industry? I think there's a couple of things. We have both breadth and scale. So we also believe very heavily on having in-market expertise. So we, where we have physical presence, we try to have expertise so that when our teams are going out on site to deliver that experience, that we deliver a quality experience. We're not always, not always relying on engineers from the center of our company, so to speak, to roll that out. So, you know, our expertise are pretty widespread. So not only do we do the, the normal networking and systems type work, we have a pretty um, robust Microsoft practice. I think we're a gold partner in 16 of 18 different competencies. We also have a security compliance um, enterprise security and risk management team. So you're doing compliance audits, vulnerability assessments, penetration testing. Um, just last month, we actually purchased another company out of Iowa that has a SOC as a service offering as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays in um, into our security space over the coming months. Sure. And when you talk about breadth and scale, that sounds to me like you have to be able to scale not just up, but down and, and sideways, if you will. It sounds like you have a lot of different types of organizations that you're servicing and a lot of different industries. So how do you serve that variety? How do you scale up and down and remain efficient? It must be something that can be very, your costs could spiral out of control trying to do that. Yeah, so it's it's sometimes different to address the different markets that we have. So our market is pretty much comprised equally in thirds of small and medium business, um, medium to large enterprise, and then the, the government and education space. And sometimes those needs are very different. So you have to have offerings that address the needs that they want. In the SMB space, they typically don't have security professionals, so we end up being the security professionals for them. In the enterprise space, a lot of times it's more of a co-managed solution. So you really have to have solutions that address the needs of each of those different Different classes. For us, we have separate engineering teams in a lot of those spaces where um, they focus on you know, a specific tech stack for that specific market segment. So they become more expertise in there. So a SMB type engineering staff, as well as an enterprise engineering staff. So they focus on different manufacturers in some cases and more elaborate technology at the higher end of that spectrum. 
So with a sizable uh, public sector uh, business, and I I have to assume quite a bit of education schools, how is that a challenge? And is there something about security in that domain that you need to be more mindful of? I think the biggest challenge in in the sled space is budget. So a lot of times they're so focused on hardware migrations of replacing a one-for-one type endpoint at the desktop or networking or servers, a lot of times security often gets overlooked, albeit it's being more and more important. So for them, it's also more on physical security sometimes than IT security. So we do work with customers on things like video surveillance systems, badge access systems. But what we're trying to do on the IT security side is really look at look at building best practices around policy. So everything starts with that policy and then you can measure to the policy as you move forward. They are moving more to devices that maybe have less susceptibility, you know, things like Chromebooks where they're really not storing data there. They're more storing it up in the cloud so they can more protect those cloud assets and they get a little bit less worried about some of the endpoints. But, you know, you definitely have to have that comprehensive policy and then the tool set that goes with it. So I suppose the uh, as a service mantra applies to that budget conservatism. You have to be very cautious and conservative about how you spend. Does automation and integration play into that? Is there a a payback, if you will, when you automate more, when you go policy-driven, you use multi-tenancy to its full effect? Yeah, so for us, multi-tenancy is absolutely critical. So I run our cloud services division. So what that is, is it's our data centers. We have two data centers that we operate, and then it's our managed services team. So as we look to security tools like endpoint security, it was absolutely critical that these things were multi-tenant. So we had products before we found Bitdefender that 20,000 endpoints, all with a single management console. You need to roll out those types of scale, you have to have consistency. There's a lot of great security tools in the marketplace, but if they don't play into your operational processes, they really don't do you any good. So as we look to do evaluation for endpoint security and EDR specifically, we need to make sure that Number one, it was it was a good product that we looked at, you know, MITRE attack trends and things like that to see where they were playing within the MITRE attack framework. But number two is how did it work into our processes and into our tool set? Could I have a global policy that I could roll out to everyone so they knew that I had consistency? It's inefficient for me to go touch 600 different customers within that portal to make one change. I need to make it at a global level and have that be inherited down the chain. At the same time, you know, we do have you know, more enterprise customers that do want control of those policies. So we were looking for a tool that would allow us to give them the access rights to customize the policy or manage their portal as they saw fit. So, you know, we really liked those aspects of it specifically. Sure. And like we talked about sprawl earlier, where people go and try all kinds of new services and products, one of the challenges in security is the sprawl of so many tools. And it's almost incumbent upon us as the consumers to be the systems integrators. What do you look for when you're evaluating your security suppliers and services when it comes to uh, how well they integrate services, how well they combine tools and requirements uh, so that you don't have to? Yeah, so a lot of times we're looking for integration. Um, you know, we're a ConnectWise shop end to end, so we'd like to have it integrate into that tool set. So whether it be pushing the software out through ConnectWise Automate and those kind of deployment tools, whether it be alerting um, within the tool set to let us know that there's been a ticket that's been created, or better yet, even closing out that ticket once it's been remediated, you know, those are very important to us. You can't just use email anymore to notify people of issues that arise because it just becomes noise. And we've consulted with customers where they have things like monitoring solutions. Or I even have a better example than that is we had a city government here locally that had a ransomware attack. And they had security tools that actually notified them the day before that the hacker was in the system. But because of all the noise, they didn't have the the alerts tuned enough and the process as well defined enough that they missed the alert. And the next day they were hit with ransomware and and encrypted across um, the entire environment. So lesson learned that it's not just about having the tools to block it. It's about having the processes in place to react when the chips are down, right? Yeah, and integrates into your processes, as you pointed out, in your help desk and your other systems that are already in place. You have to take advantage of what you put in when it comes to fast remediation, fast alerts. Yeah, email just doesn't cut it. Okay, uh, let's think about um, reporting and data and understanding what's going on. It's very related to what you were just describing. Having information that's not made available to the right people in the right way is, is not good information. So what do you look for when it comes to reports, that single view Uh, the one throat to choke, if you will. Yes, I think the 
the big piece for us there is we need to be able to be notified of the alert immediately. So we've created mechanisms that if there is a critical alert, it's paging out to people that are on call. It's setting off other alarm bells for us to react very quickly. You know, from our SOC services perspective, we outsource uh, much of our, our kind of MDR services. So we create workflows with those vendors that are overseeing some of those security aspects of who should they call first? How does that escalate through our system? So we make sure that those can be addressed pretty quickly. I tell the story to a lot of our prospects that we had, a, it was Friday before 4th of July, and I got a call from one of the SOC analysts telling us that we had someone in a, in one of our clients' environments that was making some lateral movements, and they were pretty convinced it was a hacker that was in there. Had that gone on for another th- three days, who knows how they would be. Now, the, the good news to this story is it wasn't actually a hacker that was in there. They were having a penetration test done within their environment over that weekend, so no harm, no foul there. But you know, had that been somebody that was in there, you know, you, you hate to even guess how, how far they could have gotten throughout the environment and how pervasive that could have been without having someone quickly notify about that. You know, many of our clients, they may have seen that in one of their portals had they gone there. They might have seen it in an email when they got to it, maybe the next week when they got back from vacation. But when it comes to security, you know, time is money. All right, let's look at, at your security perspective when it comes to solving some of these issues. We've looked at what you'd like to have, what you insist upon as important uh, priorities. What have you settled on? How has your journey been focused in terms of what you settle on and where you're heading in terms of solving some of these issues? Yes, yeah, so I think there's there's probably two aspects to it. So as we look at endpoint security, you know, we spent over a year analyzing different platforms. You know, we looked at all of the major vendors out there, the the Sentinel ones, the CrowdStrikes, Microsoft, Sophos, Sina, you name it. We looked at kind of all of them. We narrowed them down from there based on capabilities, based on some of the tool set integrations, based on their go-to-market strategies, you know, some competitive natures. Then we went in and started doing field trial tests. So we put it in place. We would kick the tires, test it, integrate it to our tools to make sure those workflows came through. And then we we move forward from there, rolling that into our offering. So it's a pretty detailed process. You know, that one probably was probably a little more detailed more detailed than many of them out there. So I think that that's probably a big aspect of making sure you you have, you're not just jumping in and saying, well, this one's rated really well. Let's just take that and move forward with it. One of the competitors in that particular space that we looked at, we really like the product, but we also look at financial capabilities of that company. You know, they, they should be profitable. They shouldn't be hemorrhaging cash left and right. So you need to make sure that they're going to be in there for the for the long haul. Having been in the IT space for 30 years now, you, we've seen a lot of great vendors come and go. And so, you know, that's almost as important as as important as their financial viability as is the technology that they're using. So. Okay. Tell us about the uh, the way in which you're fostering, as we pointed out at the beginning, uh, an increased reliance on as a service integration and automation. How has the the, the current stable of uh, resources that's are, that are available to you fitting that bill and, and how much further do we have to go to get to where you need to be? I mean, I think it's going to always be a constant evolution, you know, with security changing so fast. What we try to look at is who's integrating more openly, who has APIs to integrate into other tools. So talking about Bitdefender with this recent acquisition that we have, they they do a lot with Azure Sentinel. So we're working on an integration into Azure Sentinel so that we can have these cross-platform things looking at it, have this layered approach. So, you know, making sure the tools that we have kind of integrate with the overall platform so that we can kind of pick and choose the right platform to deploy to the customer. I think the other piece of it is, is you really have to work closely with the customer to make sure that they have a proper... I, I use a thing when I'm talking to managed services customers called the operational maturity levels. And so I, I have like five different levels and you move kind of up the levels up and to the right. And I think you have to kind of take that same approach with security, you know, make sure you're starting with the most, the core components to make sure that you have the big, the big building blocks there first, endpoint security, firewalls, advanced threat protection, onsite and offsite backup policy management before you start moving into some of the next gen things, you know, starting to see SASE technology, zero touch network access, zero trust at the endpoint level, DNS protection. I mean, you can go on and on and on. Also things like security awareness training. So our team is actually, our enterprise security and risk management team has come up with kind of a top 10 list that we do a lot of presentations on, like start with these 10 things and it kind of in these order. And then we can start to talk more about where we're going to go as your budget allows. I think the other big thing is to really get out in front of it from a budgeting perspective with your clients. I think security is probably 5x what it was, you know, just five years ago. And we don't necessarily see that in the budget. And a lot of times IT has a, a real struggle relaying the value of that to the business leader. 
I like to tell stories and relate things back to what I've seen in the past. And I was at a, a vendor, kind of a trade show event, and one of the security analysts was with, up there was telling us about a, a letter that he received the day before from one of his MSP partners, which he got from a client, which was basically, it was an extortion letter from a cyber attack that said, we've been in your business for the last 30 days. We have 300 gig of your files. Here's the list of files we have. You can pick any three. We'll send you a copy of the file just to prove that we have it. This is purely financial. Here's how much money you want. Oh, and by the way, if you don't pay us, we're going to start calling every one of your competitors and every one of your customers to tell us that we have your data and then try to extort them in the same fashion, right? So it's you tell that to a business owner and it almost makes you sick. So those types of things are happening out there every day. They're a lot of times I don't think they're very well publicized because people don't want to know that they, they've been hacked, but it's it's real and they need to react to it and, and take it seriously. And telling those kinds of stories, or if they have somebody that they know that's been hit up for, for ransomware or extortion, whatever it may be, those you know those local stories make a big difference too. So, And on that uh, same point of relaying the value, what are your KPI top several, you know, the very most important salient KPIs for you to demonstrate to your leadership that you're you're spending your money properly and wisely. When it comes to things like EDR and what Bitdefender is providing for you, how do you prove what uh, what the value is? Yeah, so that's that's a tough question. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, we really look at where we see threats, you know, infections and reactive support needs. So we have a we do have a IR team here, um, incident response around kind of helping those clients. And so, not that you want to necessarily get to that level, but we kind of track what's happening there and and how many alerts and remediations and things that are fixed, you know, on a monthly basis to kind of approve your value. You know, a lot of that time we're spending. From an MSP's perspective, we're sending reports out to our clients, kind of showing these are the things that we've seen, these are the things that have been blocked to make sure that you're, you know, they understand the value that's being there because it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. If they don't have a problem, they don't necessarily think that any any problem ever existed. So just because you're blocking something, you, you know, you're doing a good thing, but they don't always realize that. Of course, not being hacked or ransomed or extorted also probably factors pretty high up there. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's look to the future before we close out. Jason, I appreciate your candor. What comes next? What are you looking to do in the next three years? We talked a little bit about the last three. Um, How would you like to see uh, your uh, security uh, environment, your posture uh, improve, and how can your suppliers be a very important part of that? I think some of the big things that we'll look at is what tools are working better together. Where can we consolidate some of the reporting? So tool sprawl is it's it's a real problem out there. Trying to bring some reporting from the different tools together so that we can show kind of an overall um, kind of cohesive strategy, I think, is going to be more and more important. Working with vendors that are really open. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see more of the manufacturers get into standards where they're sharing things more in a cohesive fashion. So whether it be endpoint security or maybe DNS protection or zero trust that, you know, security threats can be more consistently delivered to reporting mechanisms like SIM tools to roll those up and have a better overall visibility and and health dashboards. I think some of the other things that you'll start to see is more API integrations where you have reporting tools that now are able to work with vendors to block things. So maybe your endpoint security is integrated into your SOC services, you know, have, have at the click of the button where they can disconnect that or block that particular event automatically or even manually when they see those issues without necessarily having to move into different tools. I think that's where you'll see some of the automation components come. And then they'll start to create workflows that work with that. So an event is triggered, they can use that to run scripts against things to start to shut things down or disconnect them or remediate right at at the get-go at inception to prevent it. That's That's where I think things will head more. Well, great. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. You've been listening to a sponsored briefings direct discussion on how IT services providers are moving beyond past practices to seek out more automation integration and acquiring security solutions as a service. And we've learned how Heartland Business Systems is seeking new ways and new partners to assure that security incidents are kept in check across a variety of hybrid IT services and scenarios. So please join me now in thanking our guest. We've been here with Jason Nuss, Vice President of Cloud Services at Heartland Business Systems in Little Chute, Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Jason. Thanks for having me, Dana. You bet. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at Inter Arbor Solutions, your host and moderator for this ongoing series of Briefings Direct Discussions. A big thank you to our sponsor, Bitdefender, for supporting these presentations. Also, a big thank you to our audience for joining us. Please pass this on to your IT and security communities, and do come back next time.